This presentation is about ascites, the subject of the 13th chapter of the textbook, Frameworks for Internal Medicine. Each of the 50 chapters and frameworks begins with a case, and that's where we'll start here. You'll notice that some of the information in the case has been concealed. Unlike standardized tests, which give you all the information that you need in order to solve a case right up front, we're going to begin with the bare bones of the case. This is more realistic. In real life, clinicians have to extract information and clues from the patients that they then use later to solve the case. So we'll learn a little about our patient, then we'll build a framework around one of our problems. A framework is an organized differential diagnosis and serves as a collection of hypotheses. We'll then use that collection of hypotheses to inform us of the information that we need to gather from the patient in order to rule out or rule in a particular hypothesis. So let's begin with the case. This is a case of a 54-year-old woman with shortness of breath. A 54-year-old woman with a remote history of Hodgkin's lymphoma is admitted to the hospital with progressive shortness of breath over the past few months. She also describes an enlarging abdomen and bilateral lower extremity swelling. She has gained 20 pounds since these symptoms began. The patient is an avid bicyclist, but has been forced to give it up in recent weeks because she can no longer keep up. The lymphoma has been in remission since treatment without evidence of recurrence. There is symmetric distension of the abdomen with bulging flanks and the presence of shifting dullness to percussion. What is the most likely cause of ascites in this patient? All right, now that we have the bare bones of the case, we're ready to choose a problem from the case that we can then use to build a framework around. So which problem should we choose? The obvious choices here are dyspnea and ascites. Either one is good. Sometimes when a case is complex and there are multiple disparate problems, you can build multiple frameworks and focus on the overlap. That's similar to how a Venn diagram works. For the sake of this presentation, we will build our framework around ascites. Before we do, let's review some basic information about ascites. What is it? Ascites is the abnormal accumulation of fluid within the peritoneal cavity. Patients with ascites often present with predictable symptoms, including increased abdominal girth, a sensation of abdominal fullness or discomfort, dyspnea, early satiety, and a sense of decreased mobility. Physical findings of ascites include symmetric abdominal distension, bulging flanks with dullness to percussion, and shifting dullness. Now that we've gone over the basics, we're ready to build our framework for ascites. What are the two scenarios in which acidic fluid forms? Acidic fluid can form in patients with portal hypertension or in patients without portal hypertension. How do you determine whether there is portal hypertension or not? You calculate what is known as the serum ascites albumin gradient, or SAG. To calculate the SAG, you take the serum concentration of albumin and subtract from it the acidic fluid albumin concentration, which you would know if you have sampled the fluid with a procedure called a paracentesis. And when you perform this calculation, out comes a number. It is important to know whether the SAG is greater than or equal to 1.1 or less than 1.1. This tells you whether the fluid has formed as a result of portal hypertension or not. If you commit the number 1.1 to memory, that's great. But like most things in medicine, it is always better to understand the idea behind something than it is to simply memorize a number. So you should try to understand why portal hypertension causes a high gradient. What two forces govern the movement of fluid in and out of the capillary space? That's right, hydrostatic force and oncotic force. What is the major oncotic player in blood? Albumin, which is represented in the SAG formula. So if you have a high gradient, it means that you have a healthy amount of oncotic force in the blood that's not allowing fluid to simply leak out. And you don't have very much oncotic force in the peritoneal space that's pulling fluid in. So what force must cause the movement of fluid from the capillary into the peritoneal space? Hydrostatic force. And that comes from portal hypertension. The causes of portal hypertension can be subdivided according to location relative to the liver, prehepatic, intrahepatic, and posthepatic. And this sequence begins with the portal system and ends on the other side of the liver where structures such as the inferior vena cava and heart are located. Now let's switch gears and focus on the non-portal hypertension arm of the framework. This is a low gradient caused by either a decrease in oncotic force within the capillary, which allows fluid to leak out from the capillaries into the peritoneum, or an increase in oncotic force within the peritoneum pulling fluid from the capillaries. In the case of poor capillary oncotic pressure, the acidic fluid will be protein poor, defined as a total protein concentration less than 2.5 grams per deciliter. 
In the case of increased peritoneal oncotic force, the acidic fluid will be protein rich, defined as a total protein concentration greater than and equal to 2.5 grams per deciliter. And now we can begin to fill in the framework. Here are the prehepatic causes of portal hypertension. For example, thrombosis involving the portal vein and or splenic vein can cause portal hypertension. As far as hepatic etiologies of portal hypertension, by far the most common cause is cirrhosis, especially in the industrialized world. Additional examples include entities like schistosomiasis, acute liver failure, primary biliary cholangitis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Post-hepatic causes of portal hypertension include conditions such as heart failure, constrictive pericarditis, and Bud Chiari syndrome, which is thrombosis involving the hepatic vein. In patients without portal hypertension, protein-poor acidic fluid is caused by hypoalbuminemia. As we discussed, albumin is the main oncotic player in blood, and when it's low, the decrease in oncotic force within the capillary space allows fluid to leak out into third spaces in the body, including the peritoneal cavity. Causes of hypoalbuminemia include nephrotic syndrome, malnutrition, and protein-losing enteropathy. On the other hand, protein-rich acidic fluid represents increased oncotic force within the peritoneum that pulls fluid from the capillary space. Causes include malignancy, pancreatitis, and tuberculosis. This is the full framework for ascites. This represents a collection of hypotheses and tells us what information we need to know from the patient, including historical information, physical findings, and testing. This can now be carried out in a hypothesis-driven fashion. For example, if we want to explore nephrotic syndrome, we might ask the patient specifically about foamy urine or order a urine protein to creatinine ratio. So now that we're armed with a framework, we can revisit the case. The first thing we want to know is what is the SAG? We're given a little bit more information about the case. We have performed a paracentesis and find out that the acidic fluid albumin concentration is 2.5 grams per deciliter, while the serum albumin concentration is 3.8 grams per deciliter. When we perform the calculation, we discover that the SAG in this case is 1.3. All right, so now we know we are dealing with conditions on this side of the framework. We have essentially cut our differential diagnosis in half, which puts us in a great position to solve the case. Now we can really focus on these entities. We can ask hypothesis-driven questions, look for hypothesis-driven physical findings, and order hypothesis-driven tests. For example, if we're interested in evaluating for cirrhosis, we might ask certain historical questions about alcohol use and hepatitis exposure. We might look for sequelae of cirrhosis on exam, like palmar erythema, spider angiomas, or caput medusa. We might order tests, like imaging of the liver. Since heart failure is on the differential, we should seek historical information like orthopnea and proximal nocturnal dyspnea. We should specifically listen for an S3 gallop. For constrictive pericarditis, we're interested in any history of lupus or radiation exposure to the chest, for example. We would look at the jugular venous pulse closely, trying to assess for Kussmaul sign, Friedrich sign, or the W sign. This is the interplay that you should have with the patient. You can reference your framework, and it informs you what information you need to gather from the patient. Recall from my other talks that in order to make a diagnosis, a clinician has to, at the very least, do three things. One, the clinician has to know what information is important to acquire from a case. Two, the clinician has to have the skills to acquire that information. And three, the clinician has to be able to synthesize that information to make a diagnosis. All right, so let's get back to the case and gather some of that hypothesis-driven information that we know is important to acquire. From the first paragraph, we learn that the patient has had mantle field radiation to the chest, which again is important for some of the diagnoses that we're considering, including heart failure and constrictive pericarditis. We also learn that the patient drinks several glasses of wine nightly, which makes cirrhosis rise on the differential, or possibly alcohol-related cardiomyopathy. Next, we learn that there is no palmar erythema or spider angiomas present, which raises into doubt any underlying cirrhosis. We also learn that the patient has tattoo markers on the chest, again confirming that she has received radiation therapy to the mediastinum. Also, the JVP is elevated with paradoxical rise on inspiration. This is known as Kussmaul sign. These physical findings are beginning to narrow the differential diagnosis to post-hepatic causes, and specifically cardiac or pericardial disease. Now we know that based on our differential, listening to the heart is going to be very important in this case, and we anticipate that perhaps we might hear an S3 gallop or a pericardial knock. Indeed, we hear an extra sound just after S2, 
It's best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, indicating that the sound is higher pitched, more consistent with a pericardial knock than an S3 gallop. Finally, we learn about some additional laboratory tests, including a normal platelet count and a normal INR, which suggest preserved hepatic function. We also learn that the acidic total protein concentration is 4.3 grams per deciliter. This can be very helpful in differentiating cirrhosis from other causes of portal hypertension, as one would expect the total protein in the acidic fluid to be greater than 2.5 grams per deciliter when hepatic function is normal. So based on our hypothesis-driven information gathering, what is the diagnosis in this case? The diagnosis in this case is constrictive pericarditis. This presentation has hopefully illustrated the importance of approaching a case armed with a framework. It allows you to interact with the patient in a hypothesis-driven way. Would you have sought a history of chest radiation in this case if you hadn't already considered constrictive pericarditis? Would you have stared at the jugular venous pulse specifically looking for Kussmaul sign? Would you have heard the pericardial knock? There's an expression in medicine that every clinician should know. The eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. Anticipation is a large part of diagnostic reasoning, and that's why the framework system is such an important diagnostic tool. I hope you enjoyed this presentation on ascites. We use the framework system to approach a case. The ascites framework that we generated allowed us to conduct hypothesis-driven data acquisition in order to narrow our differential diagnosis and arrive at the correct answer. The framework serves as a collection of hypotheses to help us understand what information from the case is important to gather. If you enjoyed this presentation, then you might like Frameworks for Internal Medicine, which contains 50 similarly structured chapters on common topics in internal medicine. Thank you. And special thanks to Anisha and Maniraj, who are a couple of outstanding medical students who helped to organize and put together this presentation.